Oh, Judy, what are we celebrating? A new episode of Garden Time! Welcome to Garden Time, and Judy, I had huh? no idea <laughs> What an amazing musician you are. Ah, William, I'm a woman of many talents, and you know, and I love cooking, and later in the show, I'll be cooking with my friend Christina. We also will introduce you to an author who wrote an amazing book on how plants work. But coming up first, the lowdown on loquats. Well, I am at One Green World today with Sam, and Sam, would you characterize your business as kind of edibles and unique plants? Yeah, a focus on edibles, but lots of other fun stuff we like too. Yeah, and they always have fun stuff. And so you have two kind of interesting edibles that maybe you're going to tempt people to put them in their yard because you can't buy this fruit in the store usually. Yeah, there's maybe some specialty markets with this, the loquat, and you can probably get the underripe fruit that doesn't give a good representation of the fig. But yeah, to really get this fruit of the highest quality. You gotta grow it yourself. Right, and so tell us about these loquats, they're beautiful plants. I know, they're gorgeous, huh? Um, and they're evergreen, they look like they're tropical mm -hmm. almost. Um, and they're somewhat tender, you know, hardy to USDA zone seven, but we've seen them sail through every freak winter event we've ever had here, um, for the past 80 years at least. <laughs> uh, they're evergreen, they flower all winter long. Oh, wow. Um, the hummingbirds love them. And typically they were seen as not quite viable here in terms of fruit production. Mm -hmm. And maybe on a commercial scale they're not. Maybe you don't want to plant a loquat farm yet. <laughs> but we've seen them fruit every year on some of the trees we've checked in town, even wow. this year after the it hard spring crazy frost. spring, yeah. And so what does the fruit look like? It's clusters? Uh, they are in clusters. Um, and they're these little orange fruits, uh, sometimes white, and then either orange or white on the inside with this shiny, almost bead-like seed on the inside mm -hmm. um, and if you didn't know it or look carefully you wouldn't know that they're related to apples and pears because oh, they wow. look so different very much but you look at the fruit and then the end of it you're like oh i see yeah <laughs> yeah then you can see really it's a rose relative right right that is cool yeah well it is so pretty and i think that there's one for a smaller yard or a bigger yard yeah with different we're, kinds. we're working on all sorts of new varieties now we're cloning ones uh from all over Portland, ones that we've seen have really good fruit wow. or are particularly productive or self-fertile. And then we've brought a bunch up from California where people have been growing them for a very long time. And there are some dwarf ones that only get six or eight feet. We're Perfect. grafting onto quince to keep them smaller. Um, otherwise they can get 20 to 30 feet if you oh. never prune them and let them grow for 50 years. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. And then figs. And I think if you've never tasted a really good fig off of a tree, you've never tasted a fig. So really to get one for our yards is premier. Right. And they're gorgeous. They're one of the easiest fruits to grow. People always come in here and say, I've never grown fruit before. I want to grow a peach or an mm, apricot. Yeah, and I'm like, a little hard. no, no, no. Right, Try right. a fig first. Right. Um, because they're so much easier to grow than many of our stone fruits. Uh, they're pretty climate adapted coming from Mediterranean climates. So once they're established, you often don't have to water them. And the variation in diversity in various figs is through the roof. Ah. Tell us about this one here, because I think that's one of the most interesting, because the leaf doesn't even look like a fig. Right, yeah, it's not as deeply lobed. It's a little bit more palmate. And uh, this is one called Black Madeira. And it is a, a thing of myth and legend in the fig world. <laughs> okay. And that people say it's the best tasting fig they've ever had. It's this deep black fig. Um, and until recently, and even still, it's incredibly rare. And it's a little bit slower growing, but we've grafted it onto Desert King and more oh. vigorous figs to get it to go. Uh, and it should be in our catalog next year. Wow, and so they have this great catalog, this great place down in Southeast Portland. So you have to come out, talk to Sam and the other people here and get some interesting fruit for your yard. Thanks so much. Thank you. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. 
We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. 1,112? 1,113. William, what are you counting? I'm counting all of our wonderful friends on Facebook. And we invite everyone to go to Facebook and like us and follow us. All you have to do is go to Gardentime.tv and hit the Facebook icon, which is in the top right hand corner. It's the best place to get the most updated information on Garden Time. So all you have to do is click us and like us. Life is better out in the country. French Prairie Gardens is your country retreat. Stop by for some beautiful plants for your garden. Pick up some homemade baked goods or just sip a microbrew. French Prairie Gardens, farm fun for the whole family. Well, do we have a treat for you. We have a new cookbook and the author right here. We're with Christina Cavallero, Edict. And Christina, you've written this great new book, From Vine to Table. So what is the subject? The subject is zucchini. And we've always had zucchini in the kitchen. I love cooking with it, and it's one of my favorite vegetables. Uh, so we're Italian sisters here. Yes, apparently. that's right. <laughs> and so this really, this has from um, starters to breakfast, all kinds of recipes, all the way to dessert. So really, it's a comprehensive cookbook book all about zucchini. That's right. Yes, it is. And so what is the recipe that we're going to be doing today? Today we are going to be cooking pasta Mary's caponata. And so it's a combination of uh, my heritage from Bari. And in Bari we do a lot of fish and we do, of course, a lot of pasta. And also half of my heritage is from Sicily. And so Sicily is famous for their caponata and it uses a lot of zucchini as well. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And the first step is we're going to be warming up some olive oil and we're going to be putting in... Um, so it just looks like some red peppers, fresh red pepper? Fresh red pepper. Lovely. And what else do you some mean? onions. Mm -hmm. And then I was hoping that you could help me okay. cut up some zucchini because All we'll right. put that in with these and saute them. All right. And you know, I think that we all have the zucchini and we know our favorite recipes, but you've really gone farther than that in this cookbook. Yeah, well this, this recipe actually has a story behind it. Okay. Um, when we were visiting my aunt and uncle for the very first time, about 20 years ago, uh, we got our signals mixed up. They thought we were coming about a week later. Oh. So my aunt had already cleaned her kitchen from lunch and we show up hungry <laughs> and so she puts her kitchen back together and throws this recipe together and I just wanted to recreate it. I thought it would be great and it, it brings back our memories of when we visited where my grandfather was born. So just in the spur of the moment she had all this in her kitchen. This is, yes, exactly. So these are ingredients that are um, pretty well in any Italian kitchen, the zucchini, the onions, the peppers, um, the capers, uh, and uh, Lovely. pine nuts and raisins. Uh, these are things that I think are staples pretty much in at least my family's you know, kitchen. And really a summer kitchen, you would have a lot of this in there. That's right, yes, thank there's you. There's capers. Here's some capers we're gonna add. And raisins, that's kind of nice. So there's like a sweet and tart, savory kind of element. Exactly, yeah. And that's part of the caponata part. Yeah, it, to add the raisins to it. Thank okay. you. And then we're going to add the pine nuts and get those um, a little browned. Okay. And really, it's so nice you could do it on the stove top and on a hot day, you don't have to get the oven going. Exactly, exactly. And I forgot to mention, we are at Standard TV and Appliances, and they have the most beautiful kitchens here. I would love to have this in my home. Oh, I would too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is a great Gen Air six burner, so we're only using one, but really you can have something else going on another burner at the same time. Absolutely, yes. And I like the different sizes as well. That is nice. Mm -hmm. So about how long do you need to um, saute that? We're going to saute this for about five minutes and let, let the vegetables soften a little bit, mostly the zucchini, because the uh, onions will soften fairly quickly. So we'll, we'll do that and then um, we'll be adding the pasta and we'll be adding 
the secret ingredient, which is sardines. Now, ah. I, I know not everybody likes sardines, but because my family's from Bari, it's a sea village, and they always do everything with fish. And so the sardines add just a little bit of zing to it. Oh, great. So, Well, we're going to take care of that, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. So, Christine, it's only been a few minutes, so what did we do while we were gone from the... We added the sardines ah. and we added the cooked pasta. Excellent. And the sardines really gives it that cool flavor. I mean, it's just an interesting flavor in it, isn't it? It does. It gives it that little secret ingredient, a little bit of zing. Ah. Okay, and so then what do we do now? What we're going to do is we're going to just pour this into our pasta dish. Okay. And we're going to give it a little bit of garnish and we're ready to go. And what do you have here? You have some fresh herbs from your garden. I do. I have some fresh flat parsley, Italian parsley. Okay. I have a little bit of oregano and I also have some basil. All right. And some Parmesan cheese, of course. <laughs> All right. So we're going to lay that on there. Pretty presentation. What a beautiful bowl. And here's the Parmesan cheese. Okay. And that's always such a wonderful addition to. It is. And so where can we get this lovely book? Because there are so many incredible recipes in here. Thank you. Well, we can get it on my website. All right. Uh, Amazon carries it, as well as locally Bauman's carries it. So. All right. And then you have a blog, and it's on travel and food, isn't it? It is. It's christinasfoodandtravel.com. Ah. And uh, we talk about our trips to Italy and a lot of the recipes that I make. Uh, well, you know, this smells really good. I wish you could taste it, too. We're going to taste it right off camera. So if you're interested in this wonderful book, please go to Garden Time. We'll click you over to Christina's blog and her website, and you can get one for your own cookbook recipes today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. When I came to Capital Auto Group the first time, I was looking at a WRX, of course, never financing a car before. I was very limited when it came to, you know, putting money down and stuff like that, and they were able to really help me, and they worked diligently for two days, and they eventually got my payments to where they were reasonable and I could actually buy the car. They actually cared about me and what I wanted, not what they wanted. At Capital Subaru, I got it my way on the parkway. A destination farm and garden market featuring the very best each season has to offer. Smith Berry Barn offers seasonal farm fresh fruits and vegetables and specialty herbs and perennials. Visit the historic barn for distinctive gifts, gourmet foods, and homemade milkshakes. Right now we have fresh picked or pick your own berries ready in our fields. Here's what we have to offer this week. Centrally located off of Shoals Ferry Road between Sherwood and Hillsboro, Smith Berry Barn, growing good taste from the ground up. I am standing in a beautiful park. It's called Foothills Park, and we are here in Lake Oswego, and I'm with Kevin, and you work for the city of Lake Oswego, right? Yes, I do. So, Kevin, today we're going to be talking about sprinklers. It's, it's that time of year when, you know, we have to start thinking about watering our yards. Correct. And first of all, let's cover all of these older type above ground sprinklers that a lot of us have. Well, these are, these are some of the more common ones that yeah. you're going to see. And there's, you know, there's as many sprinklers out there as there are people that buy them. It's true. <laughs> but this little guy here is a little whirly gig or spinner type, and this will throw sprinkler patterns out in a circular pattern or a square pattern, depending. What you have in your hand, William, is, a, is a, what we call an impact sprinkler. And we call it an impact because the water well, it impacts, that's right. impacts that it. Makes and sense. these are adjustable as well and so you can get half or full circles. Yeah. And then I think everybody has seen the old standby oscillator, yeah. which is a back and forth and you can adjust the distance and stuff. So these are the, some of the more common ones that are on people's yards. And what is, what is the perp, like why would I use this versus that versus, what is the reasons for that? Well, area coverage is a huge thing. Um, people in a larger yard might use that or people that are watering and they have a, different layout of the ground because you can you can adjust this is going to be a circle no matter where That's you put it pretty much what it's and be. so if I needed to water just this area down here and I set this in here I'd water the sidewalk okay. and we all know that's a waste yeah so this way you get a little bit more variance in pattern you have some control to. we do okay yes. so that makes perfect sense now if let's say that that we have a, a sprinkler system in ground you know something mm -hmm. that's already in there right. 
I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions that that might be a little different, but to prove that, why don't we walk over to another place and take a look at those Sounds things. good. All right. Let's go. So now, Kevin, we are over in a, in a part of the park that actually has all in-ground systems Correct. here with different types. But, you know, the first thing I wanted to ask is, I, I think a lot of people might go, oh, well, that's the city of Lake Oswego. They probably paid a fortune for unique stuff. But this is all sprinkler systems anybody can buy and put in. Very common. Anybody that has um, an engineered sprinkler system put into their yard will have these. These are not uncommon. You can get them at any store, any hardware store, any sprinkler facility. They're very common. So then tell me exactly what these are. What is their name? And we call them pop-up sprays, um, basically because they pop up out of the ground and spray out in a, in a fixed pattern. So unlike the, the impact that we saw back over there, these stay consistent. They stay where they're at. Mm -hmm. yes. And then I would assume that there's also the availability of having ones that you put by a sidewalk so you get a half spray, all of that Right, stuff you can variate the nozzles. If you look here, you can see the different nozzles. The, the yeah. important thing, this time of year, it's a really good idea to fire these up and, and take a look at them and see what's going on with them. These things will go out of adjustment. And so, you know, your half spray may be watering your, your, your trees or watering your house. Yeah. And you need to adjust them back in or look for breaks or anything that's not working, working the way you want it. Because you want a very unique, very um, even pattern of water being spread thing. out. Now, what about right across the aisle here? What is the kind that is coming over here? These are called rotors. These are, are a pop-up just like this, except they don't have a fixed pattern, and you'll see they move back and forth based on their oh, adjustment. Okay. So they're okay. much like the impact, except you don't have the impact. So you don't get woke up in the middle of the night with a sprinkler going so off. So it's just air. that real gentle, Very smooth much, yes. flow of water out. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is one more thing that we want to talk about, but that's in another part of the right. park. So let's take a walk over there okay. and look at those. Terrific. So now, Kevin, we are at another place, and this is... A, a different type of sprinkler. Tell me about it and why you like it. These are called multi-stream rotators. Um, every major manufacturer makes these in a varying, you know, shape or sizes. Yeah. But the beauty part of these are, is if you look out at that pattern, there's a multi-stream and a very fine stream. The bodies of these sprinklers right here are the exact same ones that we saw over there. Yeah. There's nothing different. All that has changed is this nozzle. Okay. And this nozzle is, these will fit oh. any sprinkler made. So you just take that old nozzle out and put okay. one of these in. So Automatic. you're not even undoing, you're really not Don't have to anything dig anything up or okay. anything. Yeah. Okay, that's very clear. And now. by putting those on, it's an automatic 30% right off the bat. Of savings on of the water? Savings bill? of water. They wow. are 30% less water right out of the gate. Well, and we're going to show people how they can actually test this theory. But first of all, I also wanted to cover when when you a sprinkler system you have to make sure that the grass doesn't grow over that happens a lot doesn't it Correct. in the winter time so what's here, the way you guys do it here at, at, at uh, foothills park the the staff comes around every year and they they basically cut the grass away from the top of the nozzle here yeah because over time the grass grows up and it'll inhibit that nozzle from lifting up okay it'll literally block the nozzle so it's a good idea every spring to go out Clear that stuff away from your, or your from your sprinkler body so that your pop up will rise up because you need that clearance in or order to get that water to, line exactly. Up. So now one of the things that we always talk about though, especially going into summer, is how much water do we use? These are a great little product to do that with. So we're going to set some of these around and then talk about how they fill up and why they fill up the Correct. levels they do. All right, let's do that. All righty. So now, Kevin, I saw you, we got these great little cups from conservehuo.org to measure water from sprinkler systems. I saw you placing them, but th what was the reason for the way you placed them? Well, if you, if you look at a sprinkler, there, there, there's two places typically where the water comes out at the greatest volume. One is back in by the head okay. itself, and one is at the farthest extent of the sprinkler. All right. And so to get an average, you want to get that water in a more representative spot sure, that's sure. going to be. So you set them in about one third from the end and about one third out from the top, and that's going to give you the best average. Well, Kevin, I have to say, we ran this now for five minutes, and this is amazing to me. Yeah. This is five minutes, and this is the multi-stream rotator. And why we like this is the fact that it puts the water out at such a low rate 
We don't get the, the runoff into the streets. We yeah. don't, it, it puts it out at a rate that the, the ground can actually absorb it, which is what we want. And that makes so much sense because when you see an overflow of sprinkling, all, uh, especially gardeners know that there's that level where you just can't, it won't take anymore. Exactly. It just runs away. So this does it at a rate, you might have to run it longer, but it's actually doing what the sprinkler is supposed to be doing. Correct. And, and in most cases, um, typical Americans will overwater 30 to 50 percent. Yeah. These, if you put them on the pop-up sprays that we saw over there, will automatically, right out of the gate, save you 30 percent. Wow. So wow. You, you shouldn't even have to change your programming. So Kevin, you mentioned that the pop-ups use a lot more water than this, this system does, but I would imagine that those oscillator, older sprinklers, really use up water. Quite a bit. And, and the beauty part of this system is, is you can use it, it whether or not you have a, an installed irrigation system or you use a hose. Yeah. It will still tell you how much water your sprinkler is putting down and give you that kind of control so that you know, based on need, how much water you need to put down, how many minutes. Perfect. So then, Kevin, once you have that number from putting all the cups together and getting that average, then you can use the weekly water number. Correct. And you can go to conserveh2o.org and you can get that number and they post it every week. We'll tell you how much water you need to add to your yard. Great. So, Kevin, you know, we really wanted to appreciate the time you took to give us this information. And we also wanted to thank the city of Lake Oswego and the parks department here, especially out here at Foothills, which is really a beautiful park. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that happen in the summertime, and one of the things we have to do the most is water. We want to do it consciously and do it the best we can, not only to save money for ourselves, but to help our environment. So you can go to conserveh2o.org to pick these things up. You can also go to gardentime.tv. We will click you over to the Regional Water Providers Consortium, and you can get all kinds of information about how to water your gardens effectively this summer. Thank you so much for your time, Very welcome. Kevin. Thank you. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Hi, I'm Sarah with Portland Nursery, and I'd like to invite you to check out our website where you'll find valuable gardening information that you know is local to our area. Check out our gardening solutions page where you'll find over a hundred helpful brochures, or sign up for our email newsletter to receive timely gardening advice, inventory updates, and upcoming classes and events. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. On 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. Why do the finest builders shop at Standard TV and Appliance? One of the advantages that we have with having an educated salesperson is that when we're coming in and describing exactly what we want, they're able to give us a few different options. We may have thought we knew exactly what we wanted, but at the end we were able to be educated on the process to then be making the most informed decision they could. Standard can make your dream kitchen a reality. Setting the standard since 1947. Standard TV and Appliance. Well, it is my great delight to be sitting next to Linda Chucker Scott, who wrote How Plants Work. And I, I, I wanted to just start right off and say, you know, I, I've perused through it a little bit and I haven't had time to read the whole book. It, it's really, though, about the science of plants and nature. What, what motivated you? What was that motive to go, yeah, I'm going to write that book? <laughs> well, I get asked questions all the time about details about why plants do the things they do. Right. And there wasn't ever a good resource to put them towards. And because I came into horticulture kind of late in my academic career, I thought, this could be this could be a great book because no one's ever done plant physiology for gardeners before. Right, because you would think, and and one of the things I noticed just reading little parts of it was already it it's not terrifying. It's science, Hopefully but it's not. not you know something that people would say. Oh well, if it's about science, I shouldn't read it because I won't get that. That's not how it is. So it really can explain things. So even the simple folk like I, who don't have science degrees and stuff, we can understand it. Was that something that you thought, I'm going to do it that way? Specifically that. <laughs> because that, since I've been in an extension, which has been since 2004, right. my whole job is to explain science so that normal people can understand it and not just academics. Right, so I translate. Are, yeah. Exactly. What would be the good of explaining something if the, half the audience or people that read it or under, walked away and didn't know? So that would be very... That it's would be, a lot more fun speaking to hundreds or thousands of people that are interested in the topic rather than a, a narrow little group of academics on some esoteric 
right. bit of information that makes no difference. So Linda, you've mentioned questions that you get asked all the time. Mm -hmm. Give us an example of one that, that really moves you into wanting to answer it. Well, people ask, you know, can I add Epsom salts to make my tomatoes grow better? Or should I add more phosphate for better blooms? And I always back up and say, what do you already have in your soil? And right. routinely people don't know. And so I say, you know, you really have to have a soil test before you add anything. And I say, it's kind of like if you weren't feeling very well, you wouldn't go to a supplement store and buy everything on the shelf and take it all. You'd go in and you'd see your, your physician, do some blood work, do some tests, find out if you had a deficiency or something, and then, then you would treat that particular problem. Same thing with your plants and soils. So you have to know what's already in the soil before you add anything else. And what I see routinely with gardeners is they can build up toxic levels of some nutrients like, like phosphorus and calcium and magnesium because they, they add these things that they're told, you know, with common sense uh, gardening uh, information that they should add, but they don't know what's already there. So you, you build up these levels and then the plants respond poorly because there's too much of something there. So I, I, I do want to know, have you, as a writer writing a book like this, have you been challenged on things that you've written about it? Yes, <laughs> and it's not on the things you might think, uh, like the, like the interest, intricacies of how plant physiology works. It's usually on some product that someone has sworn by all their lives or their grandmother swore by all their lives and they've always added it and they always have wonderful results, they say. Right, right. And so when they read that there isn't a good reason to add this product or that the product could actually do damage, um, because it's challenging this deeply held belief, you know, there's a knee-jerk reaction to that. But that's fun because it, it keeps me on my toes. I have the opportunity to try to, to change someone's mind with science and not just with a belief. And sometimes it works. Right. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Well, I tell you, you know, this is a wonderful book from Timber Press, and you know how we at Garden Time enjoy Timber Press. So for more information on where you can get it and, and who, who to contact to get, you know, a copy of yourself so you can learn all about nature and the science behind it, we invite you to go to gardentime.tv. Linda, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank what a you, delight. William. I really enjoyed speaking to you. We wanted to thank you all so much for watching Garden Time today. And Judy, I've got my drum and my drumstick, and I'm ready to join the band. <laughs> ah, and you too can join the band. Please go to gardentime.tv and click the Facebook page and like us. And you can always go to gardentime.tv to watch more on today's show or past episodes. William and I thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week here on Garden Time. Okay, Judy, let's play them out. All right. <laughs> The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.